Two years ago, Cliff Bradshaw unearthed a crumpled cup made of solid gold. The cup had lain undetected for thousands of years, but now it's ready to take its place in history. Find out whether it makes Cliff as rich a man as the Bronze Age millionaire who first drank from the Ringlemere Gold Cup. Treasure. It's all around us. Look at that. Every day, new finds are bringing our history to life. I think we've got a find over here. I'm Miranda Kristovnikov. Join me in this hidden world where passions run high, where secrets are kept and where serious money can be made. The world of hidden treasure. The Ringlemere Cup lay hidden for thousands of years, but it nearly didn't make it. Farming equipment inflicted terrible damage to the cup. But why was it buried in Kent? What can the Ringlemere Cup tell us about our past? And what is it worth today in hard cash? I went down to Kent to meet finder Cliff Bradshaw to hear his story. This is about my fourth visit. I've been, been out here about three or four times. On this field? On this field. And I came to the conclusion that this was a Saxon period habitation. What, what sort of things have you found here? Um, fragments of Saxon brooches, Saxon coins, which is a, a good indication. So if there's a living here, there's got to be a burial site. So I right. scanned the horizon and spotted that mound out there. What, over there? Over there, yeah, that mound. sort of inconceivable. I mean, you know, it doesn't really look like it's raised at all. Well, it was raised to me. Perhaps it was the light, but it it seemed pretty obvious to me at the time. Can you see it? Well, neither could I. All I could see was a field. But over the years, Cliff has learned how to spot the clues to help him visualise the original barrow or burial mound that covered the final resting place of the dead. And then I walked to what I thought was the middle of this barrow and I'm looking at it sloping away from me each side. And having done that, I then walked around the perimeter. And it was on the way around that that this, um, this gold cup came to light. That's uh, 15 to 18 inches deep. And, and how did you feel when you found it? Absolutely just stunned. Uh, Realised it was gold, obviously very, very old, mm. but it wasn't the Saxon thing I was looking for. It didn't look very Saxon to me, but what was it? Cliff found the answer at home in one of his books. It was identical to the world-famous Rillerton Cup, But that was Bronze Age, which meant that Cliff's cup was over 3,000 years old. Cliff immediately reported his find to the local archaeologist. The Treasure Act also requires anyone who thinks they may have found treasure to inform the coroner, so Cliff told him too. I went to London to meet British Museum expert Stuart Needham, who would assess the cup for the coroner. God, it's, it's really heavy. It's... It, it, it sort of looks quite vulnerable because it's sort of mangled up, but it's, it, it's, it's very robust, isn't it? It yeah. is, uh, yeah. But how did it compare to Britain's other gold cup? Now, that's the Rillerton specimen, and I think you can see at a glance, as you did from the pictures, that there's a lot of similarity, a lot of common ground here, even to the point of the handles being virtually identical in form and decoration with this um, grooving outlining that lovely hourglass shape. The embossed designs on these items make them look really beautiful, but is that all there is to it? What they were doing was creating uh, an appearance of something really quite solid and chunky, um, but doing it with an economy of, of metal, and gold would always be in scarce supply. It also, of course, gives rigidity. I mean, if you think about corrugated iron, the purpose of that is, is to give rigidity. That's a nice touch. Not only does it save on gold, but it's stronger, and it looks good too. This way of working gold was an artistic hallmark of Britain's early Bronze Age. And it gave me a touch of gold fever. I wanted to find out more about the Bronze Age and Britain's other gold cup, the Rillerton Cup. 
So I took Cliff to Bodmin Moor, where archaeologist Caroline Malone was waiting for us. This landscape is just stunning. And this is where Britain's first Bronze Age Gold Cup was found. Caroline, how did you feel when you found out that Britain had two Bronze Age Gold Cups? Well, I was amazed. I mean, for 170 years or so, we'd expected just one, and then a second turned up and opened a whole new set of questions about the Bronze Age. So what exactly is the Bronze Age? Well, the Bronze Age is an extraordinary technological revolution, and it took place about 2,000 years BC. It transformed people's lives. It gave them new tools and weapons, and it connected people across enormous areas in the search for metal. Four thousand years ago, bronze objects were the ultimate status symbols. Men became rich by using this metal to produce a glittering array of daggers and axes. Some became Bronze Age millionaires in the process. Would metal workers be a special people at that particular time? Oh, they must have been very important people. They were probably like the witch doctors of such societies. And in fact, they could turn a rock like this raw tin and through smelting it, they could produce the ore like that, a wonderful silvery material, so from black to silver. And then by mixing it with this copper, you end up with bronze. The most amazing transformation from a, a liquid rock into this. So what was the impact of the Bronze Age here? Oh, well, you can see the Bronze Age landscape all around us. This is an industrial landscape stuffed with tin and copper on the hills over here. Mines, settlements, houses. But it was also a ritual landscape where the most important ancestors lay buried in barrows that studded the area. Three can still just be seen high on a distant hilltop. These were the ancestors eyeing the living in the community down below. Caroline took us down to look at the barrow where the celebrated Rillerton Cup was discovered. Most of the burial mounds remained undisturbed for thousands of years. But in the 19th century, many of them were dug out by gentlemen archaeologists. But it was a Cornish tin miner who discovered the Rillerton Cup in 1837. And this is the Rillerton Barrow. And this is the place where the gold cup was found, in this kist. Go on, have a look. Have a look. Was there anything else found in here? When the tin miner took the lid off the kist, he found a large earthenware vessel, and with it, skeletal remains, perhaps cremated ones, and the gold cup inside the vessel, and some faience beads, and a fine bit of dagger. Why were they burying these valuable items? Well, when rich and important people died, their descendants liked to send them off into the next world with all their best things, including perhaps their gold cups and their jewellery and their weapons. And it was partly a statement of their importance in life, but it was also a statement for the descendants that they had really important relations. So what about Cliff Sparrow? Although he had found a gold cup, there was no sign of its original owner or any other worldly goods. It was time to go back to Ringelmere to start digging to see what else could be found. But would Cliff be able to find the find spot? There's a very convenient telegraph post there, and I was able to take some pace measurements from that, and I can go back there to that at any time I like. Uh, it was 33 paces forward, and then stop, level yourself up, turn left, five paces. And that was the spot. I can find it any time. Which was just as well, because local archaeologist Keith Parfit wanted to know exactly how big Cliff's Barrow was. Keith had already carried out two small excavations. Now he was back to take another look. But what was his plan? He used a model to show me the key features of the site. The cup was found just about there. Right. And just on the edge of the mound, we picked up this huge, great ditch which should encircle the entire monument. Um, this year's excavation is to take out this area, so we get a slice right the way through the, the mound, so that should give us a, a very clear indication of the diameter of the thing. Um, and I, I think presently it's one of the biggest barrows in Kent. So we started by digging a trench by Cliff's fine spot. 
The dig is finally underway. The dig has moved in and is taking off the first 12 inches of topsoil from our trench. And Cliff and his trusty metal detector are scanning the spoil heaps to check that nothing's been overlooked. Cliff, have you found anything yet? Just these odd bits and pieces here. One coin, don't tell us a lot. That's a pistol shot. Hmm, not much there then. Time to move on. This time we were luckier. We found part of the ditch that marked the barrow's outer edge. But how big was it? Aerial photographs gave us a clue. Cliff's barrow was clearly visible. Amazingly, several other smaller barrows showed up too. Barrows come in all shapes and sizes. Cliff believes that his barrow was once big and prominent, just like these. Sadly, it's been flattened after centuries of ploughing. But he still thinks there's a stack of buried treasure waiting to be found. There may even be a body. I think a massive um, mound like this, to put just one person or very little in it, just a gold cup, Right. You know, it, uh, so you reckon there might be more than one body here as well? It's a possibility, but I feel that the, the, a, a mound of this size is not going to just hold that one cup. Yeah, That's it is huge. how I feel. So we left Keith to get on with the dig in the hope that he would find our Bronze Age body. Meanwhile, we went down to Hove where Caroline had something of a surprise for us. Caroline, why have we only got two gold cups in Britain? Well, I think there may be more waiting to be found, but of course we do have others made of amber and shale from Britain. And I suppose what makes the Ringlemere find so jolly exciting is that it now links cups from Cornwall to Kent, two gold ones at either end, but several others of different materials in the middle. The cups form a chain right across the country, from Cornwall, through Devon and Wiltshire, and on through Sussex to Kent. The next link in the chain to Cliff's gold cup is Hove's amber cup. Caroline, tell me a little bit about the Hove cup. Well, look how beautifully crafted it is and carved out of a single piece of amber with the light coming through it. And, of course, there are little features here which are so similar to our other cups, the parallel lines, the beautiful little strap handle with its decoration things. But was amber really as special as gold to Bronze Age man? Well, amber, along with shale and gold, did have special magical qualities because all these materials can carry an electrical charge. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, for example, they might have sparked in the dark or given off slight electric shocks. Rather like with modern nylon clothing, you get a slight static oh, electric static. shock. Oh, static, I see. Mm. Extraordinary material. Shocking. So even back in the Bronze Age, people were aware that cups made from gold, amber or shale could spark into life. We were all struck by the magical qualities of Hove's amber cup. But it was time to return to Ringlemere to try and find out more about Cliff's gold one. So what have these other cups got to do with Cliff's cup? Well, we know of at least three other gold cups that have been found in Europe. And I think this puts Kent right at the centre of a vast trading network in minerals, particularly tin and copper, that connects Cornwall with central Europe. So Caroline's theory links the cups found in southern England to others found on the continent, with Kent right in the middle. What do these cups tell us about the Bronze Age? Well, bronze was a new source of power and influence for the people, I think, who had access to it and enabled them to become wealthy and powerful people even in their own communities. And, of course, if you could control that trade and access to the minerals and what happened to them, then people were able to become wealthy, in fact, Bronze Age millionaires in their own right. Could Cliff's Barrow be the final resting place of one of these Bronze Age millionaires? I returned to Ringlemere with a group of metal detectorists to give Keith and his team of archaeologists a hand. Excellent turnout. Well, you all know the story, of course. We, we've got the uh, Bronze Age burial mound up on the hill behind you there. What I want to try and do today is see if we can find any evidence for prehistoric occupation. There are clues here already. I'm hoping for more. So let's make a start and see what we can get. Gavin, how are you getting on? Well, I found two Roman coins and a little bit of medieval and... Uh... Musket ball? Yeah, that's a musket ball, yeah. Yep. Not too much, but uh, it's early days yet. Finding hidden treasure is harder than I thought. Now, how are you getting on? Mm, the usual. What's the usual for you? Rubbish. Oh, oh you really do find yes, rubbish, yes. don't you? Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. There's a bit of lead, is it? Or is that uh, iron no, as well? No, that's... Um... 
clinker. It's par for the course. <laughs> oh, hang on. I'm just kidding. Oh, okay, bye. <laughs> oh, no. What? Oh, what have look, we got? there's what something here. There's something here somewhere. Oh, look. What is that? It's a brooch. Look at no, that. That is just David. perfect condition. It wasn't gold, but at least it was old. Could this be our first Bronze Age find? I took it to Keith, along with everything else that had been found. It seems to be there's quite a lot of rubbish here, but is this sort of average stuff to find? This is a very typical collection of the sort of thing we'd find in an East Kent field. Ring pool cans, there's a bullet here from dated 1940, a bit of shrapnel there, I think. It's a tractor, but I think the most important oh, right. find is this one. Yeah. Yeah. Now this one here. Now, this is something a bit special. This is yeah. a bit special. Um, it's so special, I can't actually say precisely what it is. It is a brooch. Um, the pin would have fixed here and gone into the catch plate there. It's a pre-Roman brooch, I'm fairly certain. I'm going to stick my neck out and say it's about 200 BC, something like that. So, one lovely Iron Age brooch. Although it may not seem like much to show for a day's work, cash-strapped archaeologists like Keith are increasingly reliant on the help they get from metal detectorists and other volunteers. But we still hadn't found anything Bronze Age, so I went to visit Cliff's Metal Detecting Club in Deal. This is the White Cliff's Metal Detecting Club, and this is their monthly meeting. I don't suppose you're very interested in this. Hello, Jim. What have you got there? Just another buckle. Okay. Yeah, so that's a nice one. Oh, I'd 16th. say about 16th century for that. Until recently, much of our heritage was lost because chance finds went unrecorded. Okay. The Portable Antiquities Scheme provides a voluntary framework to correct this. Information on finds is recorded and the details fed into a national database. Field Liaison Officer Andrew Richardson oversees the process. Now, what are you doing with the location there? I mean, that sounds very detailed. Well, it's, it's, it, I mean, we're simply we're getting a, 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 a grid reference. It's, it's the most important bit of information to record is the find spot because museums are full of objects um, and we haven't got a clue where they're from. The grid reference locates the find to within 100 metres of the find spot. Some objects are also photographed and the images stored on a database. Taken together, these objects offer a fascinating glimpse into our archaeological past. There's so many finds happening in the club. I'm just going to meet up with Vince, who's the chairman. He's over here. Vince, hi. Hello, You've got your, your board of finds here. Well, various things going through from the Iron Age period right the way through to 1835, in actual fact. Vince has collected thousands of objects over the years, and each one is a small piece of history. This is an Iron Age, uh, it's a woe grinder. This was used um, to actually grind down the body paints, the green and, and, and the reds or whatever they use. Even though Vince has so many objects, few are Bronze Age. Kent was keeping that part of its prehistoric past to itself, and I was getting nowhere. Cliff's Cup, however, was doing the rounds. The Treasure Act gives museums the chance to acquire new items of treasure, and the finder is paid a reward. And that reward is based on independent valuations supplied by dealers. Susan Hadida priced it at 180 to 200,000 pounds. It's so much heavier than you think it's going to be. And um, I just thought, whoever must have drunk out of this, it had to be somebody really important. James Ede weighed in at 220,000 pounds. This piece, of course, is almost impossible to value. There have been no parallels, direct parallels on the market ever. And Richard Faulkner came in top with a whopping price tag of £250,000. How did he get to that figure? I think of a gut reaction number. Then I go home, do my research, go into my library, uh, and I usually come up with the number I first thought of. Back at the dig, things had really moved on. Hi, Keith. Hello. How's it going? Going very well, actually. It turned out that Keith had a huge barrow on his hands and he was ready to tell us just how big it was. And then we come to the Great Ring Ditch, which encloses yeah, the mound. It's enormous. Huge great thing. Um, but, of course, now we've got this piece, we can actually work out the diameter of the mound. And of it's course, about just yeah. over 40 metres. Well, that must be amongst one of the biggest barrows in the country. Oh, I think so, age. yes. 
In fact, Cliff's mound turned out to be 41 metres across and some 5 metres high, which could put it in the top 10 biggest barrows of Bronze Age Britain. So the archaeologists are happy. But what about Cliff and his big idea that someone rich is buried here with all his worldly goods right beneath our feet? I feel the chap here is possibly one of these millionaires. He's done society around him a lot of good. And on his death, they've venerated him by burying him with a gold cup and erecting this huge monument as a memory of him. However, Ringlemere was holding on to its secrets. There was no sign of the body of a Bronze Age millionaire. But what about the cup? Will it make Cliff a rich man? For that to happen, a coroner has to declare the cup as treasure. And that decision is based on an object being over 300 years old and being of over 10% precious metal. Cliff's cup was made of solid gold, so no problem there. But how old was it? So how do you date the Ringlemere Cup? Unfortunately, there's no method yet of dating gold directly. So what exactly can you do then? We have to rely still on stylistic comparisons. In Cliff's case, the answer was supplied by two tiny fragments of amber which were found near his cup. Although very small and seemingly unimpressive, it's actually part of an amber pommel. And you can see here how that um, pommel would have been mounted on top of the hilt of a bronze knife or dagger. These tiny clues led to Cliff's cup being dated to sometime between 2000 and 1500 years BC. Further comparison with the Rillerton cup and dagger narrowed the gap still further to 1700 to 1500 BC. So now you've got a date for the cup, what's the next stage? It's obviously eligible as treasure, so, so we, we've written a report on this and sent it to the coroner. Fortunately, Stuart's report did the job and the Ringlemere Cup sailed through its inquest. The cup's historic value as a national treasure was assured, but what is it worth today in hard cash? Well, here we have this extraordinary artefact, a Bronze Age gold cup. The level of Cliff's reward is decided by the Treasure Valuation Committee, which meets at the British Museum. The key members of the committee are Jack Ogden, jewellery consultant, Arthur McGregor from the Ashmolean Museum, Tom Curtis, coins expert, Dennis Jordan from the National Council for Metal Detecting, and Chairman Norman Palmer, barrister and art law specialist. The committee has to put a price on Cliff's cup, Part of that decision is based on independent valuations which range from £180,000 to a cool quarter of a million pounds. The object of the reward system is to give finders an incentive to behave honestly. It does so by awarding them a fair market price. Jack, I'd like to ask you uh, to confirm, if it is the case, that there is a commercial market for something of this nature. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's a wonderful object. It's a little dented, but it's a superb workmanship. Good, thanks. And do you agree that it is restorable? There is a debate about how much things like this should be reshaped these days, because the very fact of reshaping it is altering it. So if it went to a museum, it may not be restored. If it went to a private market, it probably would. The Treasure Act specifies that finders must not attempt to clean or restore their finds. If they do so, they risk losing some of their reward. But how much will Cliff's reward be? Well, we're beginning to shade now into historic value. Well, I think this has the potential to tell us more than the Rillerton Cup. Yes. Um, so I, I would rate it very highly. Is there artistic virtuosity in this as well? Absolutely, yes. It's a wonderful example of girls' skill. I think it's far better than the Rillerton one in terms of workmanship. Well, perhaps now the time has come for us actually to talk about figures. 350. Let's say 250,000. A little bit over 250, I would say. Between 250 and 300,000. I get a sense that we are beginning to congregate around a figure of £270,000. Yes, I agree with that. Yes, I think that's a happy medium figure. I'm quite happy with that, yeah. So, we have unanimity that this committee should recommend to the Secretary of State the payment of a reward of £270,000, and, of course, in accordance with standard practice, that reward will be divided equally between the finder and the landowner. So, good news for Cliff and the landowner who stand to make £270,000. But there's a catch. British Museum director Neil McGregor says the museum doesn't have the money. 
Well, the government doesn't give us any specific money for acquisitions of any sort. So when uh, an important object like the Ringelmere Cup appears, we have to try to find the money from somewhere. It's really very difficult to raise funds. Because there's not an endless pot of money, is there? There's no pot of money at all specifically to buy newly excavated treasure. Uh, None at all. This was a bit of a surprise. Fortunately, behind the scenes, British Museum staff have been working hard to raise the cash. But where would the money come from? I went to find out. First stop, the Friends of the British Museum. Do you think you can help the museum buy the cup? Absolutely, yes. We've pledged 40,000. This is the National Art Collections Fund. They should be good for a few, Bob. Let's see how we get on. It's a mesmerically beautiful object, and we hadn't a moment's hesitation in deciding to offer a grant of £45,000. National Heritage Memorial Fund. Sounds promising. So are you able to help buy this cup for the British Museum? Unfortunately, we can't. We have no more money in the coffers for this year. What, not a penny? Not a single penny. It's the Heritage Lottery Fund, and it's our last chance. Now, haven't we met somewhere before? Yes, I'm both the head of the National Heritage Memorial Fund and the director of operations at the Heritage Lottery Fund. So are you able to help the British Museum buy the cup? Because of the access benefits and the public benefits and the local benefits that the British Museum are promising, I'm very pleased to say that we've decided to give a grant of £185,000 for the purchase of the cup. Wow, fantastic news. It looks like the British Museum are going to be able to raise the money. And so it turned out, the British Museum was able to acquire Cliff's Cup. All that was left was for them to complete the deal. Good. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to announce to a grateful nation that they have gained another piece of public treasure. Um, May I welcome you this morning to the museum and to the announcement of, I mean, really what is the museum a remarkable 250th birthday present thanks to the individual who made this morning possible and Cliff Bradshaw um, who as you know is the hero of the hour and who is convinced that there are many more objects waiting to be discovered there. The cup was given star treatment as members of staff paraded it before the world's press but the Ringlemere Gold Cup was now the British Museum's and all Cliff had left was his memories and a very large cheque. So, Cliff, the big question, what are you going to do with the money? What are I going to do with the money? I've got four children, 13 grandchildren, and I want to put a smile on all their faces. Oh, that's lovely. And then I'm going to treat myself to a small four before, so I can get across to the sites a lot easier. Brilliant. Anything else? Yes, I'm going to invest some money back into the site, because I'm convinced we haven't found the burial chamber yet. Right, you reckon there's more hidden treasure there? Absolutely. Someone's laying there with uh, gold armbands, possibly gold earrings. Right, who do you reckon was buried there then? Somebody very important, possibly the King of Kent. Seriously? Absolutely. In prehistoric times, yeah, the King of Kent. God, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and true to his word, Cliff is still out there looking. Good luck, Cliff. 